So last time we looked at um, the Gibbs free energy and we saw that it um, arises from this new kind of contact. So we had thermal contact and diffusive contact before. And last time we also looked at mechanical contact in which, you know, it sounds weird to say, but systems or a reservoir in a system can share uh, volume. And they share volume because they want to keep the pressure uh, constant. So most uh, experiments and most processes in real life uh, occur at constant pressure because, well, we are in the atmosphere. And so, you know, the Gibbs free energy is a particularly useful quantity. So the definition of Gibbs free energy was um, U, the internal energy, minus tau sigma plus PV. And the most important property uh, of this equation is that it is a minimum, it is minimized. So the derivative equals zero uh, for systems that are at constant pressure in thermal contact with a reservoir. So the pressure is constant, so dP is zero. Temperature is constant, so the tau is zero. And um, we'll see that we need one other condition, which is that the number of particles remains constant. So it's a conservation of mass kind of thing. So this is equation nine point one. So this is the beginning of chapter nine. Chapter nine is pretty short, but if you you look at the whole thing. Um, you know, the last part of chapter eight, which is the Gibbs free energy, could be in chapter nine. So um, the differential here, the complete differential is du minus tau d sigma minus sigma d tau plus PDV plus VDP. So um, constant pressure. This implies that DP equals zero and constant temperature implies that the tau equals zero. And so um, under these conditions, uh, this term will be zero and this one will be zero. And so we get du minus tau d sigma plus pdv. And if you remember the thermodynamic identity was tau d sigma minus PDV. plus mu dn. So if we put that one in here, it will be mu 
doing in um, in place of the du, it will be tau d sigma minus p dv plus mu dn. And so now this one, and this one cancel out. This one and this one cancel out. And we get that the derivative of the Gibbs free energy is equal to mu dn. So we said that the Gibbs free energy is a minimum. Uh, and so dg should be equal to zero. Uh, in order for that to occur, you know, the chemical potential in general is going to be different from zero. So dn um, must be equal to zero. I guess the way to write it is um, if dn equals zero. And this is the, the number of particles in the system is going to be constant. So you're not creating particles or you're not destroying particles, which you know happens most of the time. So something that you can notice from uh, from from these equations is that the natural that means like the easiest variables to work with the natural variables of the Gibbs free energy are number of particles pressure and temperature. Because these are the these are constant, um, so these are the independent uh, variables. So you know that in thermodynamics, everything is related to everything else. So you could, you know, put the uh, maybe the the volume there instead of the of the pressure, and uh, do the appropriate uh, substitutions. But these are the independent variables. You can see it from the from the derivatives. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite. Oh, I guess I have it here. So this is the whole thing without uh, the dt and the dp being equal to zero. So it's a general one. And I'm going to substitute the du. So it will be tau d sigma minus pdv plus mu dn. That is the thermodynamic identity. And then we have the rest. And it's tau d sigma minus sigma d tau pdb plus vdp. And so now we can kill uh, this one with this one. This one, uh, this one, and so 
in general, dg is going to be mu dn minus sigma d tau plus vdp. Uh, this one is equation 9.5. So if we analyze um, this equation, we can learn a few things like uh, if we take the derivative partial derivative with respect to to n at constant temperature and pressure that is going to be so this one will be zero this one will be zero um, here we, we get rid of the dn, or I guess we can move it over here. It's another way to see it. So this is the chemical potential. Chemical potential is the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy. I mean, yeah, Gibbs free energy with respect to the number of particles at constant temperature and pressure. And we can do the same thing for the other ones. So partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature at constant number of particles and pressure is equal to minus the entropy and the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy respect to pressure at constant number of particles and temperature is equal to the volume. So I guess important uh, relationships. This one's our equation 9.6. Okay, so We have seen several times that intensive variables do not change with, uh, with the size of the system. independent of system size. Um, what are examples of intensive variables? George? Temperature. Temperature. What else? Chemical potential. What else? Pressure, yeah. So extensive variables um, depend linearly uh, on the system size.
another example of extensive variables. Yes. Yes. What else? Volume. Mm -hmm. Yes. Number of particles, entropy, internal energy, Humboldt's free energy, also Gibbs free energy. So, so basically everything else. Hmm? So basically everything else. I guess. Yeah, I guess there are more extensive variables. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is cheating a little bit because F and G are composite variables. Um, but yes, okay. So, um, one way that we can make, you know, create, I guess, an intensive variable is by dividing any of the extensive variables by another extensive variable. And because both depend linearly, the result is um, something that is independent of the system size. So one example would be the free energy, which depends on N, um, volume and entropy. So if we divide it by N, the number of particles, then we get little u. And this will be the energy per particle. And it will be a function of N divided by N, V, divided by n and sigma divided by n. And this is just one. So that means that the energy per particle doesn't depend on the number of particles. We can get rid of that. It depends on the volume per particle and the entropy per particle. So we can do that with the Gibbs free energy also. So we said that the natural variables are uh, N, L, and pressure. And so if we divide by the number of particles N, we can call this other quantity phi you know, in the meantime. And phi is going to be a function of n divided by n, tau divided by n, and the pressure divided by n. So again, we have the, one, the n over n over here. And so this new quantity that we're calling phi is independent of the number of particles. But it is still dependent on the temperature and the pressure. And here, uh, the temperature and the pressure are being divided by an extensive quantity. These, these two are intensive. And so, you know, this is still going to be a function of tau and the pressure. So that means that G, the Gibbs free energy, is equal to N times this quantity. And that is equation 
9.10. We saw that for the case of constant pressure, I mean, yes, constant pressure and constant temperature, uh, G, the Gibbs free energy was equal to DG was equal to uh, mu dn. So we can put the dn over here. This will be now the partial derivative with, um, I guess, constant temperature and pressure. And this is equal to mu, the chemical potential. And we have that G is equal to these. So it will be the partial derivative with respect to N of N phi which is a function of the temperature and the pressure. And this will be at constant temperature and pressure. So that means that this is a constant. We can take it out of the integral. And then we just have the derivative of n with respect to n, which is equal to 1. So then this is just this quantity phi, uh, which is a function of temperature and pressure. And so this quantity that we have over here, nothing more than the chemical potential. And that is equation 9.13. So I'm going to get rid of these so that I can write more. So the chemical potential for a single component system. So here we have only one kind of N, one kind of chemical potential. This is just one chemical species. Uh, is equal to the Gibbs free energy uh, per particle, like if we divide it. So this is yet another, mm, not interpretation, but another meaning of the chemical potential. So chemical potential, Gibbs free energy per particle. In case that the system has more than one kind of um, of particle, like if you have you know, hydrogen and helium, um, then you take a weighted average, right? So uh, G will be single. If you have a multi-component, G is the sum over uh, all the chemical species J, and it's going to be mu J and J. So if you have, you know, some gas and you have, you know, one mole of hydrogen and two moles of helium, then you'll have the chemical potential of hydrogen times the you know, one mole and the chemical potential of helium times the two moles. 
So if you want to write it, if you write, want to write down the derivative of g uh, in general, it's going to be uh, sum over all the chemical species. Uh, mu j d n j um, minus sigma d tau plus p d b uh, sorry b d p so An important, um, I guess it's not a caveat, it's a, it's a feature of this equation. We said that dn has to be constant, that you cannot create or destroy particles. But this tells you that the number of particles of chemical species J can change. Uh, of course, it will become, you know, another chemical species. For example, if you have um, hydrogen and helium, I guess they only react in a nuclear reaction, but uh, nuclear reactions also hold for, uh, um, this holds for nuclear reactions. So I guess that will be like four hydrogens, you know, eventually uh, two hydrogens. Eventually they become one helium. It's a more complicated reaction. So then you'll have uh, the NH Equals, I guess, proportional. We're not doing that. That, that. E N helium. So we're gonna um, look at some examples, but you might uh, know where we're going with this. So we're gonna go to chemical reactions. And I guess, uh, as I mentioned, they don't have to be chemical. Any any reaction holds. So, uh, if you look, for example, at this reaction. I guess this is hydrochloric acid. So you get a um, hydrogen molecule, a chlorine molecule. They react and they can become two molecules of uh, hydrochloric acid. Uh, what do the arrows in both directions mean? That is reversible. So then you can also have the two hydrochloric uh, acid become those two molecules, right? So how likely is that to uh, occur? 
Mm -hmm. What would that be? Yeah. So w w where can that energy come from? Heat. Yeah, definitely. So the ones that we're going to look at the reactions are uh, thermal reactions. So they get their energy from from the temperature or from the they will occur at certain temperature. So a chemical reaction may be written as uh, new one, A1. New two, A2 plus blah, blah, blah. zero or more compactly the sum over all the chemical species of new j a j equals zero so here the a's are going to represent the chemical species. And the, the news represent uh, their coefficients. So really they are uh, the number of particles. That are reacting, you know, from that particular chemical species in the particular uh, reaction. So uh, this is equation nine point twenty three. And this one nine point twenty four. And so for the case over here of uh, the hydrochloric acid uh, reaction, A1 could be the H2 molecule, the hydrogen molecule. A2 would be the chlorine molecule, A3 will be the hydrochloric acid molecule. What about new one? How many uh, particles, I guess particles uh, of, well, how many hydrogen molecules do we have interacting? Just one. How many chlorine molecules do we have interacting? Just one. How many hydrochloric acid molecules? Any guesses? Negative two. Why is it negative? So we want this whole thing, the that we're writing algebraically, we want that to be equal to zero. And so we have to move this one over here to the other side. And so it will be a negative two. So these two molecules combine to form this one. So the number, total number of molecules is conserved. And so this has to be, the sum of these have to be equal to zero. Okay, so 
but the components of the reaction are not uh, conserved uh, individually. It's just the total number of particles. So the Gibbs free energy of this uh, reaction, I guess any reaction would be sum over all the chemical species of the chemical potential of the species and the change in the number of particles of that species that yeah, has to be equal to zero. So and again, this means that the the reaction is in is in uh, equilibrium. So can the reaction be in thermal equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium, and diffusive equilibrium, and still be changing their particles? Yeah. Right. So um, the way to to look at these. Um, reactions is, uh, you know, on one side you're going to have, you can see maybe like that. Over here you have your H2 and chlorine, your, your hydrogen and your chlorine. And this is at a lower potential. And so they will want to move to this side to become um, hydrochloric acid. And you will always have uh, some mo molecule or some of these um, molecules moving in this direction. And you will have some other ones that are moving in the opposite direction, at least in principle. But that depends on. Oops, sorry. That depends on the relative of the energy difference between the two sides. And this energy difference is going to be dependent uh, on the temperature. So. Um, I don't know for this particular reaction, but I know that hydrochloric acid uh, forms pretty readily. So I imagine that at low temperature or at lower temperatures, this is going to be definitely much more preferred than from here to here. But as you start to increase the temperature at some point, you know, there might be kind of at the same energy and at this energy you will have the same number of particles um, becoming hydrogen and chlorine than the number of particles hydrogen and chlorine particles becoming hydrochloric acid so it will be in uh, uh, in equilibrium so yeah chemistry is also thermodynamics Okay, so so D N J. Is going to be proportional to nu uh, j, and the n j is equal to uh, 
mu j and the proportionality constant is the n hat. So this is equation. Point twenty eight and n hat represents the number of times that the reaction occurs. And so um, here you express like one of the reactions, but of course, if you have Avogadro's number of particles, uh, this is going to happen many, 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 many times. And so each time that it occurs, it's one of these uh, n hats. And so each time that it occurs, is going to change the number of particles of chemical species J by Bj, here by one, by uh, negative two. So, Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so then we can rewrite the Gibbs free energy in terms of this uh, the n hat. So is the sum over all the chemical species J? Thank you, sir. Yep. New J. Mu J. Times the number of times that the reaction is occurring. So this has to be equal to zero because it is in thermal, it is in equilibrium. And so this implies the only way that that is going to be equal to zero is if this term over here is equal to zero. So the sum over all the chemical species J of Bj times mu j has to be equal to zero. This is the condition of equilibrium in a transformation, chemical reaction, transformation of matter. Um, it's an important one, so it deserves a box and it's equation 9.30. Okay, so let's see what happens uh, with an ideal gas. So for an ideal gas, um, what would be the chemical potential? And this is, we're gonna have several species um, that are all ideal gases. There's gonna be tau, uh, natural log of Nj. And N is the concentration divided by, typically it will be the 
we'll write it as NQ, the quantum concentration, but because we have another subscript over here, we're going to write it as CJ. C is the, the quantum concentration of, the, of that particular species of ideal gas. And CJ This is a, an ideal gas that has uh, internal degrees of freedom. So it will uh, rotate the one that you did in your homework. And so it's equal to the quantum concentration without the degrees of freedom times the partition function with the internal degrees of freedom. So the function is just that and so it's not we don't really need to know the the details of how the um, the energies of the internal degrees of freedom are distributed you can just take the partition function. This is equation uh, 6.44. This one over here is nine point thirty one. Okay, so the uh, this is CJ, so the quantum concentration for internal degrees of freedom, depends on the on the temperature, but it does not depend on the particle concentration. So then we can do okay, use this equation. Um, this is going to be tau, it's a big one over here, and it's outside of everything, well, it's, you can factor it outside. So is the sum over all the chemical species of the uh, coefficient and then the chemical potential is this so natural log of the concentration of that chemical species minus the natural log of CJ of that species. And that has to be equal to zero. So we can continue with the math over here. Mm. I don't have too much space, but. So some over, over all the chemical species Coefficients, natural log of NJ, um, that is equal, because we have the zero over here, the negative over here, is going to be equal to the sum over all the chemical species coefficient natural log of CJ. Okay, so I'm gonna move to this side of the floor. So 
This is the sum over all the chemical species of the natural log of NJ. And then this one is outside the log. We can put it inside as the uh, as an exponent. And we can do the same thing with the quantum concentration part. Okay, so this is equation 9.33a. Point thirty three B, and then the next one we have that this guy over here equals uh, we can put the sum inside of the natural log, and then it will be a product. So it would be the natural log of the product of all the chemical species um, NJ, EJ. And we can do the same thing for this other side. The natural log product over all the chemical species of CJ, DJ. And um, this guy over here if you have taken general chemistry two. That is the uh, equilibrium constant. So K, which is a function of the temperature because CJ is a function of the temperature, is the product over all the chemical species of CJ, DJ. And so you can see that the equilibrium constant is uh, the result of the quantum mechanics. So this is equation 9.33 D. Almost done. Have you seen the equilibrium constant before in your classes? George, remember? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay, at least one person has seen it. So then um, The equilibrium constant, which is, which is a function of the temperature, is going to be equal to the exponent of the natural log of the product of these Cj's nu j. Um, which is equal to just this product. So then the natural law tau 
uh, I guess, exponent of the natural log k tau exponent of the natural log of the product nj um, nu j. So um, from these, I'm just going to write the final version of the product for the chemical species NJ, nu J. equal to the equilibrium constant. This is called the law of mass action. So the product of the concentration Nj of the reactants is a function of the temperature only. So, you know, this is pretty, pretty profound. It tells you what is going to be the concentration of hydrogen versus helium uh, in the sun. You know, depending on what the temperature is, you can know precisely what the concentration is going to be. It tells you, you know, how many molecules of um, you know, nitrogen and oxygen you have in the atmosphere and you know, the temperature that we're at, about 300 Kelvin or so. Uh, it also works, you know, if you go to a plasma, you can know what is the concentration of electrons and what is the concentration of uh, uh, neutral particles. Uh, this is completely general. If you're uh, if you have something that can react, it is ruled by by this equation. Um, and I think that is very cool. All right. Um, that is the end of chapter nine. Um, I'm going to stop recording.